Before we begin, though, I would like to get to know a little bit about you all. So we have a few polls for you to fill out. So first, tell me a little bit about where you work and who you teach. In this first poll, it says, I teach learners in, please click elementary school, middle school, high school, university, or other. This will give us an idea of who you teach. All right, click one and we shall see. I'm interested to see this group and to see who you teach. All right, let's take a look at the results and see. Wow, it is a, quite a mix of elementary, middle, high, university, very similar numbers. But a lot of you are other. Maybe you're a student or you could put into the chat box uh, what you mean by other. All right. And now the second poll, a little bit more about you. Can you tell me uh, about this statement? I'm currently teaching my students online. So let us know, yes, you're an online teacher. Or yes, but only because coronavirus closed my school. Or no, but I anticipate teaching students online. All right, click one. Oh, and I see where you're working from kindergarten to adult continuing ed. Mm -hmm. In the language center, an access teacher. Excellent. Oh, Zebo, nice to see you here. All right, have you filled it out? Let's see. Okay, so the majority of you, yes but only because coronavirus closed my school. All righty. So actually that you've come to the right place with the right information. Okay, last poll before we start. Jared and I were curious about if you've attended one of our webinars before. So click, yes, you attended one, or yes, that you attended more than one of our webinars because we did a three-part webinar series in the spring, or no, you haven't attended one of our webinars, but you're looking forward to it. Okay. Wonderful, I'm still taking a look at what you're writing in the chat box, this is wonderful. Okay, let's check it out. We're so curious if you've been to one of these webinars before. All right, over 50%, you haven't attended one of our webinars, so it'll all be new. Okay, but some of you have, and that's okay. So we might review a few things from our webinars, but basically we are going to be sharing some new content. So if you weren't at our previous webinar, you will catch on quickly. And if you were, hopefully you will get some new ideas today. All right, now, before we begin, let's just reflect for a moment. Okay, so let's reflect on our situation. And maybe this image here will remind you of how you're feeling right now, because many of us, we're teaching online, and if you're like me, your life has changed maybe from sitting in rush hour traffic on the highway to getting through the traffic on the information superhighway. There's so many new online tools and apps, and it's more like this complicated web of new technologies, and it may feel a little bit overwhelming uh, trying to figure out what to do, what apps to use, what software to use with your students. And I see, yes, in the chat box, really too overwhelming. Well. This infographic, it comes from Alec Kuros from University of Regina in Canada, and this is supposed to represent the typical teacher network, and perhaps in the 20th century, right? But certainly, many of us might feel this way pre-COVID. 
So you are there, you've got your curriculum documents and maybe the colleagues you work with, right, in your school. Uh, maybe you like to use popular media to teach and you've got lots of printed digital resources and you're connecting with your students and also the families in the local communities. Okay, so this was a typical teacher network, but perhaps now, and especially now because of COVID, maybe you are more like this network teacher. Take a look at it. You still have some of the same uh, things, but also there's blogs, there's wikis, right? Now you're using video conferencing a lot, right? Using chat to communicate, social networking like crazy, looking at these online communities and trying to figure out what to do for your online teaching, right? How, much, how many of you feel like this network teacher? So there's so much information and what do you do? in order to be able to bring your students what they need in an online class. Now, it could be so overwhelming, and I wanted to give you a message. Now, we're gonna be talking a lot about English language teaching, and this guy here, I don't know if you recognize him, but his name is Mark Prensky, and he had coined the term digital natives, digital immigrants. He had a message about educational technology, that there are the verbs and the nouns. The verbs are the unchanging skills of education, such as thinking critically, communicating effectively, presenting logically, and calculating correctly. But then there are the nouns, and the nouns are the tools of education, the technologies that students use to learn and practice the skills. So these are all these new apps and the software, that's the nouns. Right, so as a teacher, you might feel like overwhelmed because you don't know which nouns to use, which tools to use. But what I want you to feel confident in is that you as the educator, as the teacher, have all of the skills and knowledge you need to work and help your students on those verbs, right? Teaching them how to think critically and communicate all those 21st century skills that we need. And so what I want you to do if I were to give you a choice to focus on the nouns or the verbs, what do you think you should do? Focus on the nouns or the verbs? Well, I'd like to suggest that you focus on the verbs. Okay, so if we take a look at the next slide, we can see that the verbs are the ones, of course, that are you know, never changing, right? The nouns are ever changing. And in fact, your students will always be on the next noun and the next noun. And if you're like me, you feel like your students are getting younger and younger all the time. And so you can't always keep up. But the point is you need to make sure that you're helping your students to learn how to use technology wisely. Okay, even if you're not keeping up with the latest technology tool or noun you can still teach those skills to use it wisely. Okay, I have a scenario for you, just to warm up your brains. So the scenario is this, an eager teacher wanted to integrate technology into her instruction. She decided to teach students to use PB Works. Okay, and so in PB Works, you can create content in there and their wikis. She required them to copy and paste their writing assignments on a PB Works wiki for homework. So now let's do a chat box opinion activity. Did this eager teacher transform English language learning using technology? And why or why not? So if you say yes, say why you think so. If you say no, and I see many of you are saying no, also write why or why not? Hmm, some people say yes, some people say no. But why? I think not. Gary says because it's just a copy and paste job. All right. Okay, she's just using something to replace paper. It's the same assignment, simply copied and pasted. All right. Okay, you guys have totally caught on to this because, of course, uh, the teacher was pretty proud that she had integrated technology, but she told me that she didn't receive good feedback from students because they actually felt like it was a waste of time to get into another application, get a login, then post the homework, then get reminders from the teacher to go back and look at the feedback, right? And 
and really, you know, some of the students felt like, okay, they could have just emailed the homework. So what was the point of that? And in fact, the teacher didn't take advantage of what the wiki could have to offer, which is as a collaborative tool. And so you weren't really using the technology wisely. All right, so let's keep thinking about this kind of scenario and let's make sure we're using technology wisely to transform our learning. All right, over to you, Jared. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you. I love at the start of the webinar when all of you type in where you're from and it's such an honor to be part of this global community. So uh, I just wanna reiterate what Joan said and thank you uh, for, for coming. Um, so remote teaching or online teaching, we know that it requires different methods and skills or different verbs, and, or, or not, not necessarily different verbs, but different nouns, right, um, than in-person teaching. And one metaphor I like to use is imagine that you are skilled at playing guitar. You play guitar for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden someone took your guitar away and said, here's a cello. It looks kind of the same, it has strings. Oh, and here's a bow, so there's, there's something extra, right? And, and now I want you to start playing the cello. Oh, and by the way, uh, you're gonna perform in a concert tonight in front of hundreds of people, okay? How would you feel? Uh, you'd feel pretty nervous, right? Uh, because yes, some of the skills might transfer, some of the techniques might transfer, but it requires new techniques, new skills, and you haven't developed those things. And so it's similar to when we were asked to go from in-person to online. Some of those skills transfer, right? But some of them are, are new, and so we have to develop them. And so uh, just as, as musicians learn a new instrument, you can learn a new way of teaching. And I, I love these videos where it says, here, here's one example, like one year of the cello. There are all these progress videos uh, online where they, they pick up a new instrument and they start playing and they do updates every week. And what's amazing to me is how quickly they can learn an instrument. I'm not gonna say it's beautiful music the first few weeks, it's not, it's kind of hard to hear, <laughs> but eventually uh, they get pretty good at it. And at the end of a few months, uh, they're really playing nice music. And, and I think that's probably the same for us is when we started uh, remote teaching or online teaching, if we're new to it, uh, probably didn't go super well initially, but we kept at it, we keep working, and then pretty soon we can start teaching pretty well. Um, but there's always areas to grow. And I, I love this video, this is one of my favorites, because um, you can see that she was playing the same song on a $5,000 cello up to a million dollar cello. And uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell the difference. I, she was such a skilled musician. I think that she made all of, all of the cellos sound so beautiful to me. Um, and then I saw this comment in the chat that I loved, where he said, uh, give them to me and I'll make them all sound like a $10 cello. <laughs> and I, I think I'd be the same, right? And so one takeaway that I have is that it's not the technology, it, it's not the nouns, it's teacher's ability to use the technology. It's about the verbs, right? Um, there are two frameworks that we're going to talk about in this uh, webinar. So if you're already familiar with them, if you came to one of our previous uh, webinars, you, you are familiar with the pick wrap model, but if not, we're gonna show you that. And we also developed a new framework called the four E's uh, that, that we'll talk about. So let's start with the pick in the pick wrap model. So PIC stands for passive, interactive, and creative. And what we mean by that is how are students using the technology? Are they using it in a passive way, an interactive way, or a creative way? So some examples of passive uses of technology is maybe they're watching a webinar uh, like you are right now, or, or maybe they're in one of your classes on a Zoom session and they're just watching that, right? Or maybe you've made a video for them and they're just watching the video on their own. Um, or maybe they're reading an article or maybe they're listening to a podcast. All of these are passive because it's a one size fits all. Um, there aren't a lot of opportunities to interact necessarily, uh, depending on how you use it. But then you can use technology that's interactive. So the webinar, for instance, you guys, many of you are, 
entering text in the chat and communicating with each other. And I think that's probably the best part of these things is getting an opportunity to share our thoughts and our, our ideas. And so that's, that's a great way to use technology. You can also use technology and interact with technology for research or to, to um, share ideas that way, uh, which, which is a, a very interactive use of technology. So we're moving from just passive sitting and getting the information to actually contributing to, to what's going on. Um, we can even go above that where we're creating something. So all of our um, laptops have a keyboard for a reason so that we can actually contribute, we can create things. Uh, maybe you're writing an essay or maybe you're creating a presentation or maybe you're creating a video. So all those are, are good uses of technology. All three of these types of uh, ways to interact with technology are important, passive, interactive, and creative. However, you would not want a course that was all passive, just as you wouldn't want a course that was all creative. Uh, you need a balance between these three things. Um, and so you can look at your course and think, am I a little heavy on passive? Maybe I should in include more interactive or creative um, activities. Great, and just to give an application to language learning, uh, we can connect passive, of course, to those receptive language skills like listening and reading. Okay, and and as we know, you can have a language class, an English language class, and students learning how to use the language if you only worked on receptive skills and things were passive. So we have to make sure also after we're teaching these that we have interaction. So the interactive skills, very important, and of course are connected to then receptive and productive skills, right? So maybe we're video conferencing and you're listening and speaking, uh, perhaps you're using the chat function or email, and so you're writing and reading, or like this, you might be doing everything, right? Listening to us, you might be chatting, and reading and writing. So, uh, and then the next level, creative. I wanted to mention that, yes, it's productive, like speaking and writing, maybe you're creating a video, but it's, I put, put productive plus, okay? Because it's even more than just our, uh, you know, like old idea of language skills, because we now live in a multimodal world. And so what we're really doing is working on multimodal communication now. And so if we pull this all together and thinking about this multimodal world we live in, uh, we can connect that with English being a global language and it is used in all these diverse contexts, right? It's requiring that ability to communicate and collaborate across borders. And it's also the language of science, technology, and the most widely used language on the World Wide Web. And so using English, it requires the ability to interpret information critically from multimodal sources like you see here and on the next slide. And it also would mean that you have to learn how to produce and distribute these messages utilizing an array of media and genre. So with so much information and media being consumed and produced globally through English, then it is tied to digital information and new media literacies. And so that's why I put productive plus. And in all cases, we are really developing multimodal communication. So this is a great opportunity now that you're teaching online to really integrate these 21st century skills with English language teaching. So we, we talked about the PIC, right? Passive, interactive, and creative. Now let's talk about the RAP. So RAT stands for replaces, amplifies, and transforms. And this goes along with how the teacher is using the technology. Is a teacher using technology to simply replace what they've always done? or are they using it to amplify their practice and learning activities or transform their learning activities? So replaces is you're simply digitizing what you've always done. Amplified means that you're, the, the core activity is, is the same, but you're using technology to make it a little bit better. And, and that may 
it may add some capabilities that you didn't have before uh, that can help students learn a little bit better. Transforms is you, you take the technology and it's a radical change. Uh, sometimes the activity is completely different um, because you're using technology to do something that would not have been possible with, without technology. So let's look at uh, the, the pick wrap matrix. So I showed you this before. Uh, we already talked about the pick and the rat, and then you can put them together. So you can see how you can look at an activity and think, okay, is students use passive, interactive, and creative? In this case, it was passive. Does, am I using technology to replace what we've done, amplify what we've done, or transform what we've done? And in this case, it was to, to replace, right? So, so on this, um, this example, it's passive and replaces, but then you can also have examples that are creative and transformative. It all depends on what you've done before and then where you want to go. And so you can use the uh, pick wrap matrix to try to plan out some activities and use technology that, that is more transformative. So let me give you an example. So um, you can imagine having students create a map of the continents and they color it in and they label it and then they turn it in. Um, I know that this looks like a, a very young learner made this, but I taught uh, 14 and 15 year olds and I also saw maps like this <laughs> with them. Uh, so it can be kind of hard with, with some of these students to actually read what they wrote and, and it gets kind of messy. So maybe um, I could just keep it the same where I, I have them take the picture and send it to me if I'm teaching online or I could give them a digital map that they just label. So I, I could say, you know, maybe it's not the best use of time to have them color it in. I, I've got this map. Let's just have them label it. And that's good enough, right? So, so I'm not amplifying, I'm not transforming it, I'm just digitizing what I've always done. Or I can use a tool called ThingLink. And what ThingLink allows you to do is not only label what the continents are, but you can add multimedia throughout the map. So here's an example where you can see that I, I hover over this and I can read about something about that continent or I can see photos or there are even images that, that I could, or, or videos that I could play about um, that continent. So now if we go back to our, our matrix, is, it's still a map, right? But now we've amplified it with technology. So we've added something else to it, but the core assignment is still kind of the same, right? But now let's imagine, I think, you know, instead of a map about the continents where they draw and label the continents, let's have students create a, a travel website for extraterrestrials visiting Earth, planet Earth. And so they can show our new overlords around the continents and around Earth and kind of uh, roll out the, the, red, the red carpet for them, right? So this is transformative because it's not a map anymore and they're doing something entirely different, right? And they're doing something that would be very, very difficult without technology. Everything on the pick wrap matrix has a time and place where it's good, right? But one thing we need to remember is that if, if you're only at the replaces part over here, if you're only at the replaces, you're not using technology in ways that, are, that is going to impact student learning. In order to impact student learning, you have to amplify or transform the activity with the technology. And we know that because it's not the technology that impacts learning, it's the activity. It's not the noun, it's the verb, right? So um, we have a long history in, in education of simply using technology to digitize what we've always done. We saw this in the spring when we had to go online. We, we took the in-person classroom and we put it on Zoom, right? Or maybe we have, instead of having students handwrite something, we have them type it up. Or instead of having them read a paper book, we have them read an, a digital book or an e-reader. All of those examples, the, the, the verb is kind of the same. We've just changed the noun. We've added technology, right? We've digitized it. Um, and there's good reasons for that, right? I, I don't wanna downplay the importance of, of using technology to replace because it provides for access. Imagine if we didn't have Zoom uh, when school shut down, that'd be pretty bad, right? Uh, 
it provides us access. It provides us with more efficiency, cost effectiveness, and a novelty. It can just be fun to use new technology, right? Um, but again, we know that there are good reasons for replacement, but replacement will not impact learning because it's the activity that impacts learning, not the technology. Absolutely. Now, I would like to take what Jared has just said and give you an example. So he gave you an example that was for younger learners. And now I'm going to give you an example that's for older learners. Okay, and also try to demonstrate how you might use the rat part of the pick rat model. Okay, so this next example is going to be about what can you tell from this word web or make a guess? Okay, so this example sure is about getting a job. Okay, and so let's look at the next slide. So if you're teaching older learners um, or perhaps even business English, you might have a unit all about getting a job. Okay, so on the left, it's just a, uh, uh, from a textbook. It's called an, I'm Enclosing My Resume. But let's say you build a unit on it. And at the end of the unit, students will be able to write a professional resume and cover letter for a job they want in the correct format. They have to use action verbs and power words to describe professional skills, education, and experience for a job, and then participate in a role play as an interviewer, an interviewee, asking and answering questions related to the job announcement, resume, and cover letter. This might be a typical unit about this particular topic. Okay, so let's take a look at in what you might be doing in a face-to-face -face class, right? So this might be your objective. By the end of the unit, students will be able to demonstrate their ability to do a professional job interview in English successfully. And in person, you might be doing a role play with a partner right there so you can practice those skills. Well, now you're in an online environment. So you can use RAT in order to help you to conceptualize the types of activities you're going to do. So let's use RAT to help us plan our online instruction. So first, R, replace. Notice, by the way, in bold, I am going to have the same objective, okay? But I'm going to change it depending on how we're going to use technology. So in the first one, they're going to do the interview by role-playing with a partner in real time through Zoom like this in front of their peers and the teacher. So that just replaces it. It would be like sitting in the classroom, but now we're going to demonstrate it through Zoom. Same thing. How about amplifying it a little bit? So instead of using that online synchronous class time, maybe you'll have students videotape the role play with a partner and then post it in the learning management system on the discussion board and then share it with the teacher and peers. That saves time, but also it's uh, utilizing technology in a different way. And then students might be accessing it asynchronously. Or how about transforming it? How about by meeting individually with the teacher or a guest job recruiter through Zoom to simulate a real job interview? You might want to think about do you have access to people who might be able to sort of transform that activity into something that more mirrors authentic communication and real life? Okay, so this is how you might use RAT to take any learning objective you have and to brainstorm your ideas for how you might be able to replace it and amplify it and transform it with the technology tools that you have. Okay, so now, it's your turn. So just think about an objective maybe for your next lesson. By the end of my next lesson, Swabot, students will be able to, and then just take out a piece of paper and use RAT to help you plan your instruction. Write down your objective and then write your ideas for replacing, amplifying, and transforming. And I hope you will find it to be a helpful tool. 
All right, now we're going to start learning about the four E's. These are connected to the pick rat matrix. So the four E's, these are four ways that technology can amplify and transform learning. So it's really supposed to help you move from replace this to amplifies and transforms. Okay, so uh, the four E's are enable, extend, engage, and elevate. And Jared and I are going to take you through each one with examples. Okay, so the first one, how does technology enable the learning activity? So we're trying, we're going to go beyond replacement of previous activities. We want to add something, something new, something substantial to students learning that couldn't or wouldn't likely occur without technology. Okay, so let's take a, a look at this example. So let's say I'm trying to engage my learners. Maybe I could use this as an example from Chatterpix. So you could create a short video that enables your text to come alive. So by the way, does anyone recognize who this person is or what country this person comes from? This is a real person from history. Ah, I see. Hmm, China, Korea, Confucius, Korea. Okay, so I use Chatterpix to try to introduce this historical figure. Let's play the video. Hello, I am King Sejong. People call me Sejong the Great. I was the fourth king of the Chosun Dynasty of Korea. I became king in 1418 at the age of 21. I profoundly affected Korean history by creating Hangul, which is the phonetic writing system for the Korean language. I believe this is my greatest achievement for Korean people and culture. Okay, some of you guessed Korea and some of you knew King Sejong, who, if you ask any Korean person, this is the most famous king of all. Okay, so easy to create this where you make the mouth move. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a demonstration of Chatterpix and there's even a QR code there if you want to look for it. Okay, so it's very easy to use. And what I want to encourage you to do is to make your text come alive. Okay, so I just have it here. All right, and you're going to create a mouth on it. So let's say I just have my text. This comes from my text, Our World. And here we're learning about King Tut. Okay, all I need to do is take a take a photo of it. Okay, so I'm going to take a picture of King Tut. And then I'm going to draw a mouth on King Tut. And then I'm going to record my text so I can make this more interesting for my students. Here we go. Hi, I'm King Tut. I was a boy when I became the ruler of Egypt in 1333 BC. I was only nine. Okay, and then you create the video just like the King Sejong video. Okay, so easy to use. One, you can make your text come alive using this free, easy to use app, and your students can use it too, to be able to uh, show that they understand and practice their English. All right, now another way that technology can enable you to do more with your students is you can make a screen recording and give your students personalized feedback. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you how I gave feedback to two students who made a video about highlining that was also part of a unit from our world about extreme sports. And let's take a look and you can see the video and also how I give feedback using Loom. Here we go. Hi, I'm Aaliyah and Christiana. 
I'm really excited to see the video you made for the Extreme Sports Camp Project. Let's watch it together. Great introduction. You're speaking nice and clearly, and I really like your choice of extreme sport. Highlining, I don't know very much about it, so I can't wait to learn some more. Here we go. People can do it all year round, in winter, in spring, in summer, or in autumn. Wow, well, I'm thinking spring and summer and autumn might be great times to do highlining. I'm not so sure about winter. That seems a little bit too cold for me. Okay, let's keep going. Highlining is a very dangerous sport and only people with experience and many skills can do it. To do it, you need a mainland of women. Okay, it does look dangerous, and you definitely need to know what you're doing to go highlining. Now, I don't know what the webbing is or what arm steel rope is exactly, so it could be helpful in your video if you have an arrow pointing to each one when you read the list. Okay, let's keep going. Very funny. Good ending. Thanks for watching. I loved it. You made a great video. So, congratulations. I learned a lot about highlining, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. When I see you in class, I'm going to ask you about the webbing and the arm steel rope. All right, great job. Bye bye. All right, so uh, somebody asked this in the chat box. So it's not just uh, for video, you could give feedback on any kind of an assignment, right? So you could put up a document and make comments about a student's writing. Um, it could be a uh, PowerPoint presentation and you could also make comments on it. So if you go to the next slide, you can see there's all different types of tools that you could use. I use Loom to make that video. Okay, and so you could do audio, you can put your um, uh, yourself so that students can see you. Uh, you can also use Screencast-O-Matic. Um, and I'll give you an example a little later where you can just use your phone. Now, if you have lots of students in your class, you could use it to give group feedback or something where uh, it's not just individual videos for every single student in your class, right? You could pull up some examples and if you see common mistakes that your students have made, you can address them through a video like that. All right. Passing it over to you. Yeah, I, I love those examples uh, to talk about enable because what the students were doing was also enabled by technology and then how John was providing feedback that was also enabled. Um, I, I think that when you're using uh, screencast feedback, you can be kind of strategic on when you use it and and for whom right, uh, maybe or what type of, of assignments. Um, the, the next C is extend. So when we went from in-person online, many of us just kind of jumped to, uh, or kind of had to jump to kind of these live video calls. So I'm curious, uh, here's another poll question for you. I'm curious how much of your course is synchronous or live or asynchronous, which is more on demand. 
So you should see the poll item there if you can respond. Is it 100% synchronous or live? Or is it um, all the way down to most of it uh, asynchronous? So again, synchronous is live, asynchronous is more on demand. And it looks like the last option got repeated, but that should be 100% uh, um, asynchronous. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, so a lot of you, it's 100% asynchronous or mostly asynchronous. And so that, that's, that's kind of um, normal. I would expect that, um, especially if you're new to online teaching, if you went from in-person to online. Um, as far as the app that we're using for the polling, the, this is built in with Zoom, but there's also other tools that you can use like Mentimeter or, or other external tools for polling. Um, there are some real big advantages of having asynchronous learning opportunities or on-demand learning opportunities. For one, you don't have the same technological issues. Uh, you can also have more student engagement because everyone can participate equally or they can participate on, at their own pace. There's also some disadvantages. There are times when it's really great to have you there with the students. So if you think about what is best done when you are with the students and what's best done with, uh, for students to do on their own, and if you really think about those two questions, you'll start recognizing opportunities where maybe some things would be better if, if they could be done on, on their own rather than with you. Or you could use asynchronous or on-demand activities to actually prepare students uh, before they come to, to meet with you. There's lots of ways to do this. So for instance, this is a website. This was created in Google Sites, but you can do it in PV Works. There's lots and lots and lots of tools um, where you can create a website now. And it's super, super easy to create these websites. The hard part is to create a good website page and to know what that might look like. So I, I love this example. You can see that in the sidebar are all the lessons. So each lesson had a page. And then each uh, page started with an orientation saying, this is what you're going to do in this activity. And this particular teacher actually had an audio recording that kind of helped um, help the students become familiar. They heard the teacher's voice. A lot of teachers will actually create video recordings there as well. And then you'll see that the activities are, are simple, like watch this, read this, review this. Um, and notice that the, the directions are very simple with lots of white space in between, so it doesn't feel overwhelming. And then at the end, they're asking the student to contribute something. So that might be posting a comment or a reflection or create a video, it could be a number of things. And, and if they're doing this before they meet with you in a synchronous session, then it's a great opportunity for you to collect some information that can inform what you do when you're there with them live. So that's just a website, but there are also lots of learning management systems that are free, like Canvas free for, is free for teachers to use, which is a great learning management system. Uh, this was created in uh, Google Classroom, which doesn't have all the functionality, but you can still do a lot in Google Classroom if you have access to it. But you can see where you can start with a video orientation, and then you can have different types of activities that students do as, as, as they go through step by step. So if you, if you aren't using a website or a learning management system, I just encourage you to think about what you might want students to do when they're not with you. And then um, maybe that can actually make the time that you're with students even better. Regardless of where you are in the pick wrap model, one of the most important things is to provide clear direction. Um, especially if you're having them do things asynchronously or on demand, you have to recognize uh, some common mistakes that they might run into or issues they might run into and provide them direction so they avoid that. Because it's not like you're with them where they can just raise their hand and you stop class and you answer uh, 
it's, it's, it's a different experience. And so they can still email you and ask questions or ask questions that way, but it takes more time for them to get responses. So we have to be extra clear with our directions. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that you can use to give clear directions can also be another way to extend instruction is to just use a little video and send a message to your students. Now, let's say, for example, you're preparing students before the next class and you're going to use this book and you want to review some vocabulary and you want them to do this. You want them to show a leaf and some leaves and you give them a hint in text. You can use real leaves or draw pictures or take pictures, anything. But you might also want to review and give instructions with a video, which also helps to make it feel a little more personal. Let's take a look at this short video as a demonstration. Hi everyone. Let's get ready for next class. Look at this. This is a leaf. Repeat after me. This is a leaf. Oh, look at this. This is a leaf. I have one leaf. Now, look here. These are leaves. Repeat after me. These are leaves. Oh, look out there. Those are leaves. Do you like my trees? Okay, so for next class, I want you to show me a leaf and some leaves. Now you can do it any way you want, with a picture, with leaves that are real. It's up to you. So I can't wait to see you next class. Bye-bye. All right, so it's simple and easy. I just used my phone, made the video, and it makes it easy for students to connect to what they're going to do in the next class. All right, um, now we're going to talk about the next D, engaging. Okay, so uh, we want to make sure that also we're engaging students behaviorally, emotionally, and cognitively, okay? And so how can we do that? How can we make sure that we are using technology and making those connections? Now, uh, if you look on the next slide, you can see that we might think about, for example, the sort of passive activities. So if they're just listening or watching, um, maybe we're not sure if students are emotionally or cognitively engaged because there's no behavior, there's no interaction there. So a lot of times I hear with teachers teaching online and synchronously is that they're not even sure if students are really paying attention, if they're making a connection. Okay, so there's some ways that you can make sure you're getting some kind of interaction and students are doing something. Now, maybe you're telling a story or you're explaining something so you see students on their cameras, but they're muted. Then what you can do is tell them to use hand signals to increase engagement. So for example, this is commonly used. So this is I in American Sign Language. So if you have a question, you can, students can go like this, so it'd let you know I have a question. Or if students agree with what's being said, they can say, me too, me too. Okay, or this is A in American Sign Language, they can say, I have an answer. Okay, so using hand signals is a great way to make sure students are paying attention and that also you're making that connection with them. Okay, even if you can't have everybody talking all at the same time and they're on mute. All right, here's another way. Um, and remember, even in the language class and whether it's face to face or online, we talk about trying to make sure that students are comprehending what they're listening to. So often, 
especially with young learners, we say, okay, listen in and point to something, right? Listen and move, listen and do, right? Maybe you have to mime an animal. Listen and raise your hand or show your fingers. Okay, one way that you can also uh, use sign language to help students show comprehension visually is to use, right, American Sign Language Alphabet. So this is A. Now I can't see you, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you're practicing this with me. So A and B, C, looks like a C, D and E. Okay, practice that one more time. A, B, C, D, E. All right, so then you can use that. Let's say, I know in every class, doesn't matter what you teach, there are multiple choice questions. Well, you can check that and see who understands it. So let's say I'm using this book and I'm gonna read some of it. Okay, a uh, little frog looks up. He sees monkey in a tree. Monkey says, look at me. I can swing through the trees. Can you swing too? Little frog says, no, I can't swing through the trees. So class, I want to know, is little frog A, happy, B, sad, C, angry, or D, surprised? And I can see my student Jared is saying that all oh, little frog is sad. Okay, so using hand signals is a way to make sure your students are still involved in class because you can see their answers. Okay, you can also ask them how they felt about it, right? So um, you can ask them, did you enjoy the story, right? So A, they enjoyed it extremely. B, they enjoyed it a little, right? C, not very much, or D, not at all. So you can also get feedback on if they are enjoying it and how much they liked it. Okay, back to you, Jared. Yeah, so our, our goal is always to get students actively involved. However, they might be actively involved and have no emotional connection and learn nothing, right? And so when that happens, that's what students call busy work, meaning they're doing something, but they see no purpose, they feel no connection to it. And so uh, while we do want to increase behavioral engagement, we need to avoid busy work. Um, on the same token, sometimes we'll have them do things where the goal is not learning the material, the content. The goal is to build relationships. And I think that oftentimes before you focus on the content, you should focus on emotional engagement. So you can start forming relationships with students. Um, the, giving feedback and using a screencast is a great way to do that, right? But at the start of the year, you can also maybe create a slide or maybe have students create slides. Um, I do this with university students as well as with kids, right? And it, it's worthwhile to just spend that time. And, and if they're using a tool that they're gonna be using later to learn the material, that's even better. Um, here's another example of a teacher that created a slideshow modeling what she would want her students to create as well. So it's a great icebreaker activity. I also love this. Uh, you might think that this would be for younger kids, but I would use this with my university students too, because I kind of lean into the cheesy aspect of teaching sometimes and really show my personality. But this is Esther Park. I highly recommend you follow her on Twitter but she created these animated GIFs. And I use GIFs with my students as well, uh, which is a great way to, to kind of connect with them, show some humor um, and, and have your presence felt. Yeah, and you know, you wanna make sure activities are meaningful. And so this is just an example of something which is very important it's for very young learners. So important right now to teach these lessons. Let's just take a look at the video. Wash, wash, wash your hands very carefully in between the fingers now. Do it carefully. All right. And then you're connecting with what they're dealing with now, but also you want them to wash their hands and you can have them make up a new line, right? Wash, wash, wash your hands very carefully. 
How would you fill in the blank? <laughs> merrily, 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 merrily. How about don't forget your fingertips? Do it carefully. All right, so make sure it connects to them and it will make sure that it's more engaging. All right, now get to know your learners. Maybe you give a survey in your face-to-face -face class and you haven't yet for your online. You can just use a Google form or any quick survey, find out what they're into, what they're watching, what games they play, what apps they use, and that'll help you make it more engaging. Get all those nouns and start using them. All right, so this last E is how is learning elevated? We want to have these activities rise above those learning objectives to include authentic 21st century skills. Am I connecting it to the real world? Are my students learning to communicate and collaborate and think critically and be creative? Are they really utilizing multimodal communication? All right, so uh, remember the example that I gave you before, already mentioned with the job interview, right? That last one transformed, we elevated it, we transformed it so that students could actually simulate something real with a real job recruiter. Find ways to connect it with the real world and that's going to help them to be able to use the language better. Now also remember, technology makes it easier to do that, to get a guest speaker and connect people. So think about technology and how we connect to people in creative ways and that'll help you to transform uh, the learning for your students. So uh, Jared, why don't you wrap this up? Yeah, so um, one great way to, to elevate is to use scenarios. It doesn't necessarily have to be real. You can have very unrealistic scenarios. For instance, the website for extra, extraterrestrials coming to visit us. I hope that's not real. Um, but that's an unrealistic scenario that was was able to kind of elevate the activity or you can have realistic scenarios or you can have real life actual stakeholders for students projects. All right. Well, now it's your turn, guys. It's your turn to use technology to enable, extend, engage, and elevate learning. And that's going to get you to really transform your learning for your English language learners online. Hopefully all of these activities were helpful to you. We tried to pick activities were at different levels, but hopefully you can apply the principle and be able to use some of those apps to enhance your learning. So we really thank you for being a part of this webinar and we hope you learned a few more tips and a few more tools. Don't forget, you got to focus on what? The nouns or the verbs? <laughs> focus on the verbs and using technology wisely. So thank you. Emily, let's wrap it up and tell them about learning <laughs> moments. Thank you, Joan. So we want to tell everyone about Learning Moments, which is a showcase that we'll be running starting on October 12th, where we're asking you to share an online or blended um, learning story, teaching story. Um, some ways that you have motivated learners in the online or blended learning classroom, we've outlined about eight categories for you. Um, and we've really a place just to share your teaching tips with other teachers. We're giving you a few different ways to do this, whether you want to submit a video of you telling, um, you know, something that you're doing in the classroom, or if you want to write a submission and send in a photo to accompany that, we're open to doing this in two different ways. Um, but we'll actually be selecting, Joan and Jared will select a few submissions to highlight in their new professional development book called Breaking Through the Screen. Uh, you'll also receive a certificate for participating in learning moments, and you'll be sharing your teaching tip with teachers around the world as part of the National Geographic Learning Community. So it's coming in October, uh, more to come, but Joan and Jared are going to be the ambassadors of this. So we're looking forward to it and just stay tuned. We wanted to put it on your radar now. All right. Now just a few other notes as we wrap up. 
as you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is the first of a two part series called Preparing to Pivot, Engaging Students in Online and Blended Learning in Uncertain Times. The second session will be on September 30th. We have, uh, we're presenting it twice. So the first session will be at 9 a.m., second at 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is um, the same time as this session right now for those who joined us for this one. I'm going to put the link in the chat box right now so you can register, but it's um, available for registration right on our webinar website. Just get the link and I'll put it in there. And for notifications of new webinars, including this one, you can sign up on the webinar website to subscribe to those. So thanks everyone. And just a few uh, last housekeeping notes here. We will be sending you a certificate of attendance for joining us. We'll be sending the slides along. I know there are a few questions about those as well as a recording from the session and we'll post that on our webinar archive as well. You can actually check out some of the previous recordings of the series that Joan and Jared did in the spring. Um, those are all up on there, three previous webinars. Be sure to check out those, but we will be sending you all the follow-up materials from the session within five business days. So thanks everyone for spending an hour of your busy day with us. We're so glad you could be here and we hope to see you on September 30th. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank hope to see you soon. Have a good one. Bye all. I'm going to send you along to a feedback survey now. Definitely be sure to let us know what you thought.